Come here, the happy dog's waiting. Came here and asked Mrs. Faber. You want to ever feel the grandfather? Well, I'll make him a novel he can't refuse. Hi guys, um, I'm Neil, this yeah. is Joe, Hi. Uh, we're the Real Busters and this is the first of a series of videos where we discuss films old and new, directors, music composers, all a very eclectic mix of what we love about cinema. And beyond. And beyond. And beyond. And beyond, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so on our first episode, we're going to be talking about The Godfather. Now we're going to be talking about all three Godfathers. Yes, all but, three. Yeah, but yeah. on this episode, we're just going to be focusing very much on the first Godfather. Yeah. All three of them have been remastered into 4K. Yeah. For the 50th anniversary. Yeah, 50 Including years. 50 years, exactly. 50 years, that's crazy. And, and, and also the cut for the third one is a brand new cut that was released a couple years ago. Yes, the Coda, the yeah. death of Michael Corleone. Yeah. So, well, now we're excited about talking about that when we get to that one. Yes, that'll be but, a very interesting talk. But our first one here is we're going to be talking about The Godfather. So, I think, you know, it's a great, it's one of the classics of cinema and it's definitely one that looks fantastic in 4K. When you yeah. watch it on 4K, you cannot believe it's 50 years this film no it looks like it was shot yesterday yeah this hollywood big shot's gonna give you what you want he says there's no chance i'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse you know my father men are coming here to kill him now you want to get mixed up in the family business i never wanted this for you freedom you're my older brother, and I love you. But don't ever take sides with anyone against the family again. Don't ask me about my business, Kate. Is it true? To me, that's the genius of 4K. You know, like I've seen a lot of it, mm. these really kind of period pictures, you know, and they get the 4K treatment. And as you said, you know, they look like they were shot yesterday. Mm. You know, and again, to me, that's great because obviously, for someone who has never seen these films in such a long time, to kind of see them, you know, and remember them, and they're kind of, it's like a whole new experience for them, you know. And plus, it's very appealing for like new moviegoers, yeah, you know, so it kind of gives it this kind of freshness to it, you know, yeah. And the thing is, it's still got um, an appeal because mm -hmm. the screening of The Godfather was packed. It was a very packed screen, and yeah, even part two was really packed. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and it just shows you that these films, their place in popular mm. culture, have not gone away. So, uh, so the, your thoughts on on the first Godfather? What can we say that's not already been said? Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like it's an absolute American classic. Um, you know, and now that I'm, you know. I'm 30, you know, that we're older, you know. Um, yeah, good for you, I'm sorry, so you only enter the 30s. Yeah, um, but you know, um, the more you grow older, you know, as we were saying, you know, in a discussion earlier, you know, um, you really appreciate these films a lot more. Yeah, because uh, as I was thinking, when I was a kid, I'd, I had, I'd, I had, I was aware of the Godfather, but it wasn't mm -hmm. one of those films I was not really fast and same but as I got older it was one of those films that I really wanted to see and yeah I remember when DVD was first th just a thing and my gran actually bought my granddad um they had brought them out do you remember like the little you still get these like the little um you take the the, the sleeves out but they're like little books yes the disc, uh, yeah yeah 
and The Godfather was actually one of the first trilogies to put on DVD. Just shows you the popularity and stuff. And I remember when she bought him that, and at a very young age, I must have been, you know, nine or ten, you know, and I was kind of like, what are these films? You know, and, you know, my gran was kind of like, you know, oh, th these would bore you. You know, and as a ten-year-old, yeah, you would find these films quite boring. But, you know, I remember my granda sneakingly showing me the horse's head scene, you know, and it blew me away. You know, and I, I kind of freaked out and was like, geez, you know, that that's kind of rough, you know. But that scene always stuck with me. And then the more, you know, I became aware of it as the older I got, you know, and then you hear the famous lines, you know, yeah. leave the gun, take the cannolis, you know, and all this great movie language that the film, you know, betrays, you know. And finally, then when I finally did see it for the first time, I was blown away, you know, but each time it's been like, a fine wine you know it's got better with oh, age yeah. for me you know it's the same for you oh yeah i mean i've watched it a few times but as i said i'm once the box it comes out i'll be watching them again yeah you're lucky you're getting that beautiful 4k set and but i was thinking i things i've peeled notice that i think i think i'm happy <laughs> i think when even when i was a kid when video rental was still thing i remember seeing the poster for the third one, um, mm -hmm. it's just been out in the cinema, and I think it was coming out in home video, The Rent. Yes. Because I was like seven, or when when part three came out in cinemas. Over, 1990, yeah. You know, so I was like seven when it came out, so I, I had to see the poster of had Mar you know, the one Al Pacino. Oh, like Prem? Prem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did see that cover. And if it, but then I was also aware of Martin Brando's presence in the original one, and The Voice. Yeah. And Martin Brando, I was already aware of, because of Superman the movie at this point yeah I mean like yeah I think we are if, if you're off that age you know when you see Martin Brando you think of jor mm. but it is strange that the more you get older that kind of moves over slightly and when you hear Martin Brando you just think of Vito Corleone yeah I mean yeah, I mean, this is a film this was a comeback film for Martin Brando it was because Martin Brando had um, he was a big name in the 50s and he, had, he was on the waterfront and he yeah. and he and he had some. He kind of fell out of favor in the sixties, or or he has some. He wasn't as bankable. He had some flops, or. Yeah, I mean, like you know, you can read so many different you know things that have happened. You know, kind of, but that's kind of the thing that did happen with quite a number of those you know respectable stars in the forties and fifties and even the early sixties mm -hmm. were. I mean, you know they don't get enough. You know they don't get as much work as they did then. You know right. or and but Martin Brando yeah. wasn't blacklisted. Like I know Kim, actors like his co-star and Kim Hunter was blacklisted. No, Jim McCarthy. Yeah. I don't think Martin Brando was. He just no. But then again, as we all know, you know Martin has a very unique. Yeah. You know, take on life. Well, you know, following as I said, well, following watching the Godfather films, I was intrigued by the um, Oscars um, from that year yeah. where Martin Brando was nominated and won Best Actor. Yeah, and refused it. And refused it, but, yeah. he, didn't, but, uh, he, did, but he didn't refuse it personally. No. He, he actually had a Native American girl yeah. um, refuse it on his behalf because he was making a protest against the, the depiction of Native Americans on, mm -hmm. on Hollywood films. Yeah. I and mean, that's a very surreal moment, but you it know, is very surreal. But a it very is. brave thing for uh, uh, at the same time because because for me, I always find the Oscars are very phony, mm -hmm. and all the actors are so much in love with themselves that it's their night, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. That Martin Brando was willing to shun that. Yeah. To make a point. Yeah. It's bizarre what how the way yeah. it looked, but you know. Not but you remember it. You, exactly. Yeah. You know. You remember it. You know. But but the thing is, most actors you come across as very funny, especially when it comes to Oscar night. Mm -hmm. Because if there's one where I always think about the Oscars is pretentious. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm all for a great actor getting the recognition that they deserve. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I have seen, I like, I would watch, like, old Oscar stuff on YouTube. Oh. And then, you know, it was a lot more respectable. But now it's the glitz and the glamour and what, you know, what brands your dress. Yeah. You know, it's... Whereas, you know, I think it's it, you know you forget what the Oscars is about, and I think Brando refusing it. Although people would just kind of say, "Oh, <laughs> it's Brando being weird," mm -hmm. 
and he did see a lot of weird stuff but yeah as I say I, I'm thinking about fair play to the guy for sticking to his guns and exactly and and sticking to a belief that he had exactly exactly and but the thing is he did, but he but even though he refused the Oscar I think he deserved it oh he did yeah that that is to coin a phrase a powerhouse performance mm-hmm. by a long shot it's a great performance and at this point, after the Godfather, it wasn't Marlon Brando the actor; it was Marlon Brando the name. Exactly. Because exactly. it was the name alone that that, that Sal Kinds of want for Superman. Exactly, because you know you're coming off that, and then last time going Paris, you know, and yeah, he was a superstar then, you know, and yeah. that that that's that's unique in itself. And every film he's in, he got top billing, even though he only had a small part. Exactly. Exactly. Like even though um, he he doesn't have the biggest part of this film. Mm-hmm. He still has a great presence in this film. Exactly. Exactly. You know, because when people are there on his behalf, and it's like the, the interactions with people when they hear the name Corleone, you know, there's a respect and a fear, you know, that comes along with yeah. this, you know. And also, Marlon Brando, with that cat um, behind a desk, in front of that Phoenician blind is one of the <laughs> iconic scenes yeah I mean even an episode of Deep Space Nine um, paid homage to that it did to that um, shot with Cork you know when he became Negus in one episode <laughs> yeah and they did shot so it's like one of the iconic shots yeah you know it's embedded in again popular culture as yeah. well you know because uh, I didn't in my times it's the do people impersonate Martin Brando's video with the with the cotton exactly. balls exactly in their cheeks and that's the best thing about it because when people do that or they reference the film or say a line of dialogue even if you've never seen The Godfather you know what it's from and that is the saying of a really truly great classic yeah. film it really is yeah exactly the breakout role for Al Pacino yeah as Michael Coyone <clears throat> yeah I mean again like when we were discussing stuff about this you know and I said to you you know like they did not want Al at all who, the, who was it they wanted of you know they, they wanted you know a name of that time piece you know so whether it be say Paul Newman Robert mm. Raven I even think I could be wrong I even think Steve McQueen was rumoured to be but I think he was just a little bit too old by that point for Michael because they wanted someone kind of in his you know early 30s mid 30s you know yeah my, my, I think um, Al Pacino at that point was in his early 30s he was you know and this what did Al have done up to that point I think he had only really done he had just... done the Panic Needle Park in 71 and stuff so I think he had done a, a couple of things that was like a big role for him you know on that so uh, but then again like Paramount which was the same studio for Needle Park but they said, you know, he's, he's not bankable. You know, he's, he's not a, a, a name we can sell. You know, so Francis had to fight to keep him, you know, and then there was a lot of, you know, even when I was on set, you know, and he was aware that people didn't want him. So they done that famous scene, you know, the in the bathroom where he was to get the gun. You know, that scene was brought forward because he, he knew he could nail it. And he says to Francis, I know I can do this scene perfect. So they, they rescheduled that scene quicker and they shot it. And then it was Francis then brought that to Dailies. And then when the Paramount seen the Dailies, they were like, okay, yeah, we, we get it now. Mm-hmm. You know, we can see what he can do. So, you know, but you have to, you know, you've got to think Francis, you know, he did take a gamble, but he knew he had mm-hmm. the right people. But it, it was a big gamble then, you know. And, and obviously his performance being, when you see obviously at the start when he brings Kay Adams, his girlfriend, yeah, to Dan the wedding, yeah. just uh, yeah, Diane Keaton, um, yeah. to the wedding, and he's just come, he's just returned from the war. Yeah, he is, you know, he's <coughs> very young, you know, he's you know, dashing, he's dashing, yeah. and he doesn't want, he, he's adamant, he doesn't want to be part of the family, mm-hmm. so he's kind of like the outsider of the family. Yeah, but for the film and films uh, well, yeah. as we'll talk about in the in yeah. the next couple his journey his yeah. journey yeah. He, he, he goes through a whole transformation to a point where he takes over the fa- family business but even because he's more ruthless than his dad yeah I would agree yeah but but it was just a, an interesting journey for a guy who at the start didn't want to be part of it yeah you know yeah and then the, you know there's like lines even from I know we're going to cover this in a separate video but like lines in the third one you know and he he kind of tries to cover it up you know and he's like I did what I could 
and he almost says it in a sense that you know it's his job you know and he was saying like I've done my best to protect you and stuff you know but mm. it's really interesting because then you, you, you delve into the psychology of the character and stuff you know and it's like you know that part of him that when you first see that young dashing soldier he's gone forever after that from the moment his dad is gone down you know and it's it starts off it's just to keep his dad safe but then it's just a down spiral because he gets mm. hooked into this world you know I mean, he doesn't, and he just doesn't stop yeah because just before he hears his dad has been shot he's doing Christmas shopping exactly with yeah. with, um, with Kay yeah exactly and, and just and just doing normal things yeah you know, exactly like family things just the normal family things see you know, what other people do yeah but I, I think the turning point is you know well is when he notices he's visiting his dad hospital and he realises there's a going to be a tent in his life yeah and he says I'm with you dad yeah I'm with you yeah and, uh, he's, he's made a decision but the the scene where he comes down <laughs> those the two in the restaurant in the restaurant yeah with Sterling Hayden yeah yeah, 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 yeah. and great scene and you know that that up to that point he does have a choice, but once he's made that, he's done that. No going back. No going back. No going back. Yeah, you know. And I've seen you know um, analysts and film critics, you know, kind of you know explore that in various ways. You know, at certain points to see Michael, you know, as the tragic hero. You know, he, he's doing mm. the moral thing. You know of helping his dad, you know, and protecting his family and stuff, mm. you know, and then there's other people who go, you know, oh no, he's, he's the out and out villain of the piece, you know, yeah. he's, he's cold hearted and stuff. But see, it is interesting because I do have a friend who, um, who's also called Michael, we were talking to our friends about seeing the Godfather and Michael said, he, um, it ne- the Godfather never appealed him because he didn't find the kind of relatable. Yeah, I mean, like, I've seen, I've read stuff, you know, and heard people say it in interviews, you know, and, I can't see that. I really can't see that because once you get past that sequence in particular, you know, and then um, when Michael was told Sicily because, you know, they say, you know, you have to get away from this, you know, and then again, you know, he gets to the point where he remarries that beautiful Italian girl. Our name, our name escapes our memory. But I think it's a Paul, a Paul, a Paulinino, Paulinina, a Paulinina. Um, but, you know, you get to the point where it's like, you know, he left the love of his life behind and now he's away living in another country you know and it gets to the point where when we pick up with him you know how many years did we say it was about a year I think I think he I think he'd been in Sicily for two years two years you know and then when he and when he eventually does beat up with Kagan he says he's been back a year that's the interesting that's the other interesting thing about the film is that for you know it doesn't it doesn't tell you oh it's five years later or it's two years later exactly um, but the film spans a decade yeah you don't really see it in a way you, no. you, you know it, it's through the seat, it's through the dialogue yeah. that you know it's it's been over several years exactly because you know all of a sudden he's, he's been in Sicily for two years and it, you know uh, so it's great in a way that allows that time has passed it hasn't just all happened you know overnight this is Jeff Jeff is sad. Don't make us like Jeff. Come along and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And then we can be happy like these people. Like, comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Remember, don't make us sad like Jeff. Make us happy like these people. We're trying to get to 100 subscribers. We hope you'll help us. Helping us makes us happy. Not like Jeff. And I particularly like the fact that going back, sorry, just to that scene of a mega guns down starting here and then the other guy um, who I forget the actor's name but going from a guy who was so committed to K and he felt like you know he was wanting to settle down mm-hmm. and then when we see him in Italy he it feels like his life's a free for all did you never get that even when he, he was walking with the two guys across like the land 
and his old um I say his old he's older in the sequels, but his um bodyguard comes, you know, and he's like, I listen, I really want you to ride in the car and the look in his eyes is like, you know, and he says to him, he goes, No, I, I wanna walk. He's fearless. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And you can really start to see that transition come out in him. You know, he's like, I don't care. You know, if it happens, it happens. I do find yeah. I do find that this thing about having to relate to a character mm-hmm. uh, a bit of a mixed um um belief in you know I do I do think I do because one thing I, I don't want to see when I see a film or TV I don't want to see myself no no I, I think as I say I'm I get bored myself <laughs> so you know if the re, if the character is written real yeah then that alone should be yeah. what makes the character compelling and I think that's what makes Michael <coughs> Michael Coyone a compelling character because there is such a, a vast change on where he is at the start of the film yeah absolutely and by the end of the first film yeah oh yeah it's the other end of the spectrum no. yeah exactly he's become what he didn't want to be exactly you know it's it's like the the monster inside, the demon inside, you know, mm. that we all say we don't want to be. Uh, excuse me, on that point of, your, of our friend Michael saying, you know, he can't really relate to the character. Well, you don't necessarily have to you know relate what? to them. Do you know what I mean? You're going to watch, mm. you know, you know, it's like going to watch great, you know, historical people yeah. that you know are terrible people and you know their downfall's inevitable. I do, yeah, you know, I do. What I mean? as you say, they're compelling. That's what you want. Because I, you know, because I do find, you know, there is a tragic aspect to Michael. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, obviously, as the phones brand on, you can see the mm-hmm. the the regret and oh yeah, and the guilt, and yeah, the guilt yeah. that he had. Exactly, you know, and it's and that is the that that is the difference in 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 great writing, you know. Yeah. And sorry, I know we're, we're jumping about here and we will cover Godfather 3 in another video, but that's why I have come to appreciate part 3 even more because you really feel Michael's pain. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it gives the first two films a lot more gravitas. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because he doesn't, he doesn't want us, but he's, he's, it's been forced upon him. Exactly. And they always say that, you know, the, the great responsibility of power comes to those who don't seek it yeah but have a thrust upon them exactly because <coughs> because <coughs> i mean obviously it was thrust upon because he had two older brothers yeah sonny played by james Khan. yeah who was obviously going to be the, the the head of the family after Vito. yeah but after Vito was done down yeah problem with um sonny was he's very hot tempered and yeah easily provoked exactly you know which became his downfall at the end exactly you know what I mean and as they said you know he didn't rationalise things yeah everything was just it didn't work he would erupt feelings would erupt from him yeah. you know what I mean he didn't rationalise and stop to think about the like, consequences you know it's and like like when he saw that their sister Connie's husband yes. whose wedding is at the start of the film yes he immediately goes up and beats the guy and hits him with a trash, trash can. can. Yeah, which is one of another. Uh, oh, that's great films. Yeah, but then that's also his downfall because the guy uses that as yeah a way to lead him to his death. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. That, that that's his downfall. And Frito is too weak. The yeah, brother. I mean, and I just want to say, John Cazale, come on. Yeah, may he rest in peace. He died so young. Yeah, he really did. You know, but yeah, I mean, like as weak. As the character of Frito is, John adds so much more to him. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? He adds so much layer to this guy. Even the scene when they go to visit Mo Green in Vegas, you know, when Michael goes, I heard you knock my brother about. And all Frito wants is just things to be okay. And he says, No, he's fine, he's fine, he's fine. He knocks me about sometimes, but he's kidding, he's kidding, he's kidding. And you know it's it's not, you know, this guy's abusing them. But he, but. He, but it's kind of, in a way it's kind of like uh, like similar to Connie in a way you know mm-hmm. when he, she's been abused by the husband yeah but Frito is similar yeah but he's I think in a way he's, exactly. he's actually weaker than Connie he's um, kind of that 
he's kind of got that bit of a Stockholm syndrome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, to, so he, he doesn't want he, he he wants to see a face. It's one of the great tragedies of cinema. That character, anyway, for me. You know. It's, it's, you know, I think it's also a proof that you know, characters are not black and white. They're exactly. Gray. Exactly. You know exactly. Some people kind of say, "Oh, like, you know." Some people today, we're in an age today where people say, "Oh, that guy's a bit of a jerk. I don't like him. He's he should be cancelled." You know, there's a lot of that happening today, mm. and you know, <coughs> you know, I can't. I don't want to watch this film because that guy's too mean. There are characters who are written so obviously to be the bad guy. Yeah, you know, like like a bully on a Stephen King novel. <laughs> um, yeah, is. Um, is to say that yeah but if you do different layers to the characters you know exactly. you, you can make villains really interesting or people who have darker aspects for us so i think this whole thing about people having to see themselves in films i'm sorry um i don't want to see myself in films <laughs> in my opinion i always like to have cards i can aspire to mm-hmm. um not that i want to aspire to be um yeah but i can understand michael's plight Mm-hmm. And that's I think that's the compelling thing with the Godfather. Yeah, I would agree. And I think we have to mention um, Gordon Willis's mm. amazing cinematography in this. I think he does capture each year of cinema. Yeah, and I mean, haven't seen an eye on the big screen, watching those lavish colours. You know, because you start off with the wedding. Very warm. It, yeah, it's very warm. It's very daytime. You know, those very lush, very spring time. You know, and then you go into the room. And it's very dark. It's the mysterious. Okay. Yeah. You know, and even later, you know, when you watch the colour palette of the film, you know, you go along and the more Michael's life starts to spiral, you get the snow. It's very cold, very bleak. Did you notice that? You know, it's, it was the first yeah. time I really I really noticed it, you know, on the big screen. Yeah, night, 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 yeah, you mentioned it. Yeah, that's actually You know, it gets different. really, really bleak, you know, and it gets colder and colder and colder. As if the weather was a metaphor for Michael's yeah, scent. Exactly. You know, um, even in Sicily, when he gets when he re when he didn't marry you know, when he marries, you know, the Italian girl, um, again it's very warm, it's very colourful. And then even when you um look at that scene when he finally meets Kay after all that time it's, it it's very overcast. Did you notice I, I was just very striking when I noticed I didn't think about it at the time, but now that you mentioned it, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like also the overcast of what's going to happen to Kay as well. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? And I, whether that was intentional or not, I think it's it's brilliant. Well, the thing is, you know, if, if not intentional, at least a happy accident. Well, you know, and I do love the fact that, again, it may be subtle, but the scene that when he finally confronts K after all this time, cares with kids. Oh yeah, just, yeah. She was a teacher, wasn't she? She was, you know, and that idea, you know, Michael's, you know, I want to be, I want to start a family. Yeah. And and you know, again, as you said, foreshadowing, it's genius. You know, whether again or not, it was intentional or not. Even the cl- even the final shot of the film. Yeah. Um, where you know where where Connie, um. Is angry at him for killing her husband. Yes. Yeah. And then, and then, Kayser asking, "Did you do it?" Yeah. And he goes, "No." Yeah. But and I love that build up. Yeah. Where he, he he kind of losses it with her, and he goes, "I do not talk about my work." Yeah. You know, and it's it's just it's and Al Al's performance now is great because it's almost now he has this constructed barrier. Yeah, which you know, which is that, which is the final shot because mm. when she's wa- after she asks him walks out and she sees, watches him, the door is being closed exactly. Which is um, it's it's kind of saying that she's been closed out of his life. Yeah, up until that point, you know, as I said, you know, so, where the door closes, it's the last time she actually sees the true Michael, the Michael that's the man that she loved. Yeah, and it's gone. Yeah, you know, in my mind anyway. Because the whole I mean, it's never the same after that. No, no, no. And even I'd say even I mean even when when he we can with her, you know, there is a she, there is a kind of coolness between them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. It just it becomes more better. Yeah. 
you know it's definitely not the same as it was when he when he no. brings her to the rally at the start no and the other thing is um, you know um, even Vito says that he didn't want this life for Michael no but he also saw Michael as his favourite son yeah because I do remember a bit at the start he didn't want the photo taken with the family until Michael was there exactly and you know you could read it and thought you know it's kind of like did Vito ever want this life because again I know we'll talk about Godfather 2 we'll talk about that more yeah, yeah, yeah. Time, but um, you know but it's kind of like you know it's interesting you could delve into that but also but but, but also Vito is a guy he has um um morals mm -hmm. he did not want to be involved with drugs and narcotics exactly so he did have limits on what um yeah he wanted to be involved with yeah Sonny wanted to be involved with the drugs yeah again it's that cultural clash yeah 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 so I do think you know there there were there were lines that Vito didn't want to cross no no um and can we also mention the great music oh yeah by Nino Rotto yeah, right. yeah, uh, yeah, and I think also Francis Ford Coppola's dad also did some music. I believe he did. Yes, Carmine, Coppola. Carmine, yeah. But yeah, Nino wrote this. God, that, that theme is so iconic. Yeah, and I mean, it portrays everything of that film, and that it's mm. everything that you know what the film is in that one thing. And it's also very off the period as well. It is, you know, and when it wants to be elegant, it's elegant. When it wants to be sinister, it's sinister. You know, it's a score I, I could listen to. Yeah. You know, all day, you know, kind of on vinyl, you know. Yep, yeah. and you can listen to it on Spotify as well. You can, yeah. Not that I'm plugging it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the music's iconic, and, you know, I think that, that the way the music sets, starts off in the Parry Pictures, um, credit comes up so you can just. Yeah, that, that soft. And it really takes its time, which I love. You know, and and they're intercut with, you know, the very slow moving titles. Yeah. You know, it's very elegant. You know, you almost want to follow the music. You know, where it's going. You know, it draws you in, so to speak. Certain scenes, I think, are like, it's straight out of theatre. Absolutely. It's absolutely, it's a very theatre piece of music. Yeah. Well, I'll just finish off by saying, you know, it was an absolute pleasure and delight to see it on the big screen for its 50th anniversary, you know. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Because I'm one of those guys, you know, where, and you are as well, you know. Any chance that you get to see a classic on the big screen, you gotta take it. Oh, you got, you gotta take it, you know. And this, this series of movies was one of them, you know, by a long shot. And I do think that part two, which we'll review in the next episode, yes, is one of the best sequels you can have for a film. Easily, you know. And again, there is that thing that people say, you know, is it better than one? I would say it's on par with one. Yeah. You know, it may do one, you know, in certain areas, but to me, you know, those first two films are just It's it's a true single. It's a true single that, you know, it falls on the story. It does. It really does, yeah. Nice flow to it, yeah. But as I said, we'll be with you in the next episode. So that is our first episode where yes. we look at uh, oh, The Godfather. Yeah, so guys, if you've never seen it, you know, this is the perfect opportunity to go and watch them again or for the first time you know yeah. and you won't regret buying these beautiful new sets because the films do look stunning and beautiful 4k it's an offer you can't refuse <laughs> you had to get that in didn't you I did. <laughs> you know but no guys listen thanks very much you know for tuning in and watching this um and i hope that you know we've made you want to go and rewatch the godfather again or for the first time i'll tell you something show you maybe want to watch again i know same you know <laughs> You know, and guys, listen, you know, if you want to, um, please like and subscribe, yep. you know, because we, we would really appreciate it, you know, to get us up and going. And um, as, as a moment, we're a part of, um, we're being, we're linked to um, Chat Schmatt, which um, I do podcasts with yep. um, Johnny Porter. Joe has done some podcasts, well, he will be doing some podcasts Yes, with us. I will be, upcoming, yes. So if you ever want to check out my channel, it's called That Movie Guy Joe. But yes, guys, so um, thanks for tuning in, and until next time, keep watching. <laughs>